Hello again, my friends from New Skin. Thank you for joining me here at New Skin Live Virtual Expo. For those of you who caught my first video, you'll know that I talked about how our brain orients us to it's what we're familiar and comfortable, what we're used to doing, and it doesn't like it when we try to do new unknown things. But being innovative though, is about overriding this natural instinct and allowing our curiosity to come out and challenge ourselves. So I wanna talk about the process of being innovative by focusing not on just using a latest technology or changing for the sake of changing, but on solving problems. Problems that our clients face in a way that no one else is doing and using repetition to keep trying different ideas until good ones emerge. And being comfortable that most of our ideas may fail before we can finally discover the breakthrough ones. So, you might recall, right, that I had to build an airline from scratch in 2007. And one of the reasons AirAsia X had to be created as a separate airline is because AirAsia did not believe in the viability of going long haul, right? They had been a successful low-cost carrier in Southeast Asia, and once they became successful, they became unwilling to challenge what made them successful in the past, right? So we wanna keep doing what has made us successful in the past, and even the Singapore Airlines CEO in 2007, when he heard this crazy idea of building a long-haul low-cost airline, he dismissed it, right? He said it wouldn't work, right? So let's use one example about challenging common beliefs, right? So normally, a low-cost airline, when they think about seats and passengers, right? Some of you may recall, if you were traveling back in 2007, that low-cost carriers did not have seat assignments, right? There were no seat numbers on your boarding pass, right? You had to rush on board and grab whatever seats were available. Why? Because they believed then, right? This made passengers board faster, right? That was how the giants in the low-cost airline model operated. Southwest Airlines in the US, EasyJet and Ryanair in Europe, and AirAsia, Tiger, Cebu Pacific, all operated that way, right? And the way AirAsia, for example, made extra money was to charge passengers who wanted to be first in line to board with a service called express boarding, right? So, but if you did not want to pay, you're gonna to have to be boarding later. So when I started AirAsia X, I felt this wasn't the best customer experience especially on a long-haul airline, right? Someone like me, for example, I've got a small bladder. I really always want to prefer the aisle seat so that I have good access to the lavatory. Some of the people may prefer the window seat so that they can rest against it and, and also look at the nice views, while other people may want to make sure that their family of four is always sitting together. Or some, they may even want to make sure that mother-in-law is at least seven rows behind. So we introduced seat assignments where you can choose your seat if you're willing to pay a small fee. But even if you did not want to pay, you'll still get a seat assignment when you check in so that the boarding process is more civilized and everyone has a seat waiting for them. Now, we implemented this when we launched in 2007, but it took AirAsia two years before they too eventually adopted it in 2009. Because once you're used to doing something one way, it becomes very hard to change, even when you can clearly see the benefits of a better customer experience and more revenue. EasyJet studied us and only changed in 2012, and Ryanair followed later in 2013. So can you see why it's hard for us to change the way we approach work if we're so used to doing things only one way? Now, even after we launched seat assignments, we still had 50% of our passengers unwilling to pay for seat assignments. So how do we come up with ideas to keep innovating, right? We don't believe in asking customers what they want through focus group interviews, because customers may not tell you about things that they've never experienced before. Instead, I believe in observing our customers and finding pain points that they may not be consciously aware of. For example, what's the first thing that you do when you sit in your assigned seat? I bet most of you are gonna to start to think, 
will someone come and sit next to me? And if it does, well, am I going to be lucky enough to find a row of empty seats so that I can have the whole row to myself? And of course, if that happened, jackpot, you're going to be so happy on that flight. How do we know this? Because we're passengers too, and we observe what our customers do. And we know that on average, an airline is only 80% full, which means on average, 20% of the seats are empty. But we don't know beforehand which flights will have those extra empty seats and which flights are going to be sold out from last minute buyers. Because if we try to pre-sell a row or an extra seat, we could be losing revenue from people wanting to buy seats at the last minute. And usually those are much higher fares. So we came up with the idea of selling an empty seat option, something no airline had done before. We offered our customers the chance to get three seats in a row, but not a guarantee. By paying a small fee up front, which is dynamically priced based on expected demand, whether it's $20, $30, or $40, for example. And on the day that you check in, if there are extra seats available on that flight, we'll put on your boarding pass 27A, B, C, so that you can confidently walk on the plane knowing that you're gonna have a whole row of seats waiting for you. But if on that day, all the seats are sold in the last minute at high prices. When you check in, we say, oh, I'm sorry, your empty seat option is not available today. We refund you back that option price. So the customer doesn't lose when there's no extra seat, but gains a lot of value at an affordable price, 80% of the time, right? And that revenue goes straight to the bottom line for us because there's no cost. Those seats would have flown empty anyway. And no airline in the world had thought about this before. Usually, airlines tend to just benchmark and look at what other airlines do. But we focus on coming up with new ideas based on the problems that our customers face instead. Now, we didn't stop there, right? We kept thinking, what are the problems that customers have when it comes to airline seats? Because there were still people who were unwilling to pay for uh, seat assignments or empty seat options. Another idea was to address the problem of passengers being worried that there might be a screaming baby or toddler sitting near them, especially on a long haul flight late at night. What if we could guarantee that if you paid to choose a seat in one section of the plane, there would be no kids around you? We created the world's first quiet zone where no children under 12 were allowed in this front section of economy seats. Even CNN and New York Times wrote about it, but the headlines were AirAsia X discriminates against families with young children. But actually the parents appreciated it because even though now they have to seat at the back sections, if anybody gives them that disapproving look, look if their child throws a tantrum, they can just say, ah, don't complain, should have sat in the quiet zone. Now, because we called it our quiet zone, we thought, what if we could create a special ambiance with mood lighting to designate the seat zone. And so we asked our engineers and they dutifully got three quotations from aircraft lighting specialists. But each was $75,000, $87,000, $112,000 per aircraft. The latest LED technology that can change colors from red, orange, blue, green, purple, time with sunrise, time with sunset, wonderful. But being calculative, we realized that it didn't make economic sense because our seat assignment fees were low and we couldn't sell enough upgrades to justify that capital investment. But ours was a culture where we shared a challenge openly across the whole organization. And the technicians, they heard about this, right? And they came up to me and they said, hey boss, we have an idea. We go to hardware store and we buy colored wrapping paper and we wrap the fluorescent bulbs. And so we created this calming blue effect for just a few dollars. Now, I have to clarify because it's not a straightforward process because the airline industry, everything is highly regulated. You need civil aviation authority approval just to put a sticker in the toilet. So we had to pass multiple tests, including a burn test to make sure that the colored wrapping was not flammable. We had to pass a brightness test because if there was an emergency, there's not enough time for the flight attendants to unwrap the light bulbs. And after several modifications, we secured full certification to deploy it. 
See, sometimes innovation need not be high technology or costly. It can come from basic ideas provided we're willing to challenge conventional thinking. Now, while I share with you the successes, I also want to share with you the many failures. Because for every one successful idea like seat assignments or empty seat option or quiet zone, we had eight or nine failures. But we needed to be comfortable that many of our ideas will not work. So here's one of them, right? We thought we would be the low-cost airline, the first one to have full in-seat in-flight entertainment systems with the latest digital touchscreen technology on every economy seat where you can pre-order your meal straight from your seat, the order goes straight to the galley without having to wait for the flight attendant to come to you. Great idea in theory. But when we launched it, it was a big disappointment. We learned that people want instant gratification. Like when they order something, they want it now. They didn't want to wait 20 or 30 minutes for the food to come. But for the flight attendants, it became a mess because instead of going with their trolleys down the aisle, serving people one row at a time, now the orders were coming at different times, right? Row 13 wants chicken rice. Then I got to go to row 32 who wants a Coke and row 24 wants a hamburger. It drove them mad. Now, the other reason we installed these systems was because we thought, hey, maybe we could get people to pay a small fee to watch movies. But turns out many people refused to pay. And Hollywood studios don't trust airlines to declare how many people watch which movies. They charge us a royalty fee for every single movie title, times every flight, times every plane. Right? So we start with this huge fixed cost and we couldn't find enough ways to generate enough take up. Because our Asian customers, they would rather stare at that screen, you know, where the plane goes around the globe for eight hours instead of just paying $10 to watch movies. So we decided to scrap the whole system. It was a 12 million US dollar write-off. But no one was fired. We didn't waste time or energy to blame each other. We just moved on to something else. And so what I keep telling my team though, is it's not about being afraid of failing, but even more importantly is we must be afraid of success. Success can lull us into complacency. We need to be humble. If an idea works, we can't rest on our laurels. We've got to move on to the next thing. Remember what I said earlier about how in 2007, the CEO of Singapore Airlines dismissed the idea of a long haul low cost airline, whether it will work or not? Well, you've got to give them credit because they studied us carefully and five years later, they launched their own low cost long haul airline. And everything we did they would quickly replicate it. Remember Quiet Zone? Well, less than a year after we launched it, they launched Scoot in Silence, No Children Under 12. And when I saw their ad, I noticed, ah, multicolored lights. Well, I know how much that cost them. And so I have to keep reminding my team all the time. The only advantage we have as a small startup is our speed and agility. Bigger players like Singapore Airlines, they're always gonna have more capital, more established brand, deeper distribution, a larger customer base. But whatever we do, they can quickly replicate it. But that's okay, because as long as they're copying us, they will always be behind us. As long as we keep innovating, we're always gonna be ahead of them. With speed, what big companies do in one year, we have to do every week. Because great ideas don't come from once a year brainstorming or strategic planning. We have to challenge ourselves to be innovative every single week. And we do this by asking ourselves three powerful questions each Friday. Number one, what went well this week? Great, let's keep doing that. Number two, what didn't go well? What went wrong? Okay, let's stop doing that. And the most important question is, what do we learn from our customers, our competition, the government, changes in technology, that we're gonna try one new idea next week? We challenge ourselves to do one new thing every single week because the only way to discover a great idea is we first go through 19 bad ideas first and we learn from each one of them. So Team Newskin, it's a brave new world out there. What has worked for you in the past may not continue to work for you in the future. 
And if you're unwilling to change, then someone else may be lurking to try the new things and discover new ways to serve your customers better. So stay curious, move fast, learn from failures, and mostly remain humble and hungry. Thank you.